the last time I saw this speaker was maybe four years ago, maybe three or four years ago, and we were enjoying a few good glasses of red wine in London at the time. Um, and I always enjoy listening to this man. And I'm sure today's going to be no exception, so no pressure. I'd like to introduce you all to Sean Trainer. Sean has an international career. Um, it's, it's seen him lead uh, lots of um, change communications predominantly across utilities, telecoms, aerospace, and more recently, um, PR. Sean is very global. I never really fully know where he is. Are you in Saudi Arabia today, Sean? I am, thank you, yes. Yeah, um, thank, well. thank you for that kind introduction. Um, <laughs> I, I think I vaguely remember that glass of wine. But I'm in a country now where we can't have any wine. Um, I'm in the inspiring city of Saudi Arabia. Uh, sorry, the inspiring city of Riyadh in the, in the magical kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So uh, thank you very much. You are welcome, Sean. So um, I'm sure you'll probably introduce what you're doing. Um, but this is the guy that you need to listen to for all things to do with complex change um, and employee engagement and, and definitely uh, knows his things on psychological safety. So, Sean, I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, any questions or comments that come, I'll, I'll let you know towards the end. But all over to you, OK? Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope they'll leave enough time at the end for questions. Uh, so today I just want to talk about psychological safety and uh, specifically the, the why, the what and the how. I think the previous speaker always, all, already introduced Simon Sinek, so I think we're all very familiar with that concept. Um, I would start basically by saying that if, if anyone doesn't know anything about psychological safety or in fact just knows a little bit, this is the reference book with, from the highly respected author Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School. Uh, the Fearless Organization. So uh, a great book which sort of goes into quite a lot of the science and the evidence base around um, psychological safety, but also some really interesting case studies on organizations and programs that if only, if only they had practiced what Amy preaches, then some things may never have happened, like the Challenger disaster, like Chernobyl, etc. So um, the why, to address the why, the clue was in the title of the book, but um, when you have strong psychological safety in a team uh, and that team is working effectively, then it leads to improved learning, innovation, again, which was mentioned in the last, uh, the last keynote, and growth. And I guess I know what everyone's thinking, uh, which is here we go again, because everyone claims this, don't they? I think the employee engagement movement has been claiming that employee engagement does these things for many years. Um, however, I would probably challenge that, and my challenge to uh, myself and to everyone would be, tell me tell me how many times and many of the interventions you may have been involved with around employee engagement where you could fundamentally put your hand on your heart and say that improved learning, that improved innovation, and that improved growth. And I think if we're being honest, we hide behind the memes and the stats and the Gallup figures, but the reality is, in my experience of struggling with the, the Gallup Q12 process, it's a very hard one to prove. And uh, many people have tried and many people have failed. Uh, I often think it's like nailing jelly to the wall. Uh, however, if we do go back to a respected organization, um, Google, they did a program around eight years ago within the organization called Project Aristotle. And that project was to really get under the skin of what makes a high-performing team. And of course, they had many. So they done a two-year study looking at very many team dynamic uh, parameters uh, to really get under the bonnet and understand what really makes teams tick. And the result of that two-year study across 200 teams across their organization demonstrated that psychological safety is the number one driver for performance. And that was... a a very close correlation to team output around sales and, and, and innovation, etc. So a highly respected organization um, and one that has the evidence to prove that this isn't just consultants selling, um, you know, snake oil, dare I say, this is actually based on a very comprehensive study inside their organization that proved that psychological safety was way above the other more obvious things that people probably assumed um, had uh, a big a big factor on team effectiveness and innovation, et cetera. So the things like having clear structure and clear purpose and, 
and having clear impact and dependable teams. Yes, they're important, but again, just to demonstrate the importance of psychological safety, this thing floated to the surface. So if we move from an organization that's highly respected and sort of coining the title of Amy's book, what about organizations which are feared? I think probably um, the, the industry that's feared the most is the nuclear industry. And I'm proud to say that uh, I had a, a very rich 18 year career in the nuclear industry in the UK. Um, not at this particular plant here in Oregon, uh, Springfields, but actually a, a, a plant that had the same name, um, but it was in Preston, not at Oregon. So th this site was a site that made nuclear fuel and it was a very highly uh, chemotoxic site. So as well as dealing with radiation, there was a whole load of nasty chemicals and I had the, the, uh, the luxury of managing a, a production facility that uh, probably was one of the most chemotoxic plants in the UK. We processed 10 tonnes of hydrofluoric acid a day, which if anyone knows anything about hydrofluoric acid, <laughs> they'll know what I mean, but uh, to put it in perspective, if I was to drop a teaspoon of hydrofluoric acid on your lap, then I would give you five minutes um, before you die. And we've done 10 tons a day. So feared, not internally. So the one thing when you work in a safety critical organization is people don't fear safety, they, they respect it. And there's a big difference between fear and respect. So understanding what you're dealing with is really important. And thankfully we never had any big incidents. You know, if we did, then it would have been front page headlines, um, as well as the, 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 the catastrophic effect it would have on human lives. But um, the reality is we didn't have big incidents, but we had lots and lots of small ones, lots of little accidents, lots of little incidents, accidents like people falling downstairs and tripping and slipping and cutting their fingers and, and things like that. And we also had lots of little incidents where being you know, the nuclear industry, we had to investigate them thoroughly and many, many hours spent in management investigations trying to really understand what went wrong. Primarily, we had a very uh, highly skilled and highly intelligent workforce. Um, we had people with MBAs, for example, that were shift operators that operated the process plant. And they did that for a reason. You know, they liked the lifestyle. They were working shifts and they were working in an interesting environment. Um, but the consequence was that really in such a highly regulated industry, you lead to a culture of, of command and control. So it's very important that everyone follows the rules. And often people don't because human, humans are humans. And there was a, uh, a famous safety professor called Jim Reason that coined this phrase, which I love, um, that says, you, you can't change the human condition. We're all, in, we're all fallible, yeah? Um, however, you can change the conditions in which people work. And changing those conditions, i.e. the culture and the environment around people, I think is what can what can drive safety and, and prevent the human error or the, the fallibility that we have. And I think you know most people have probably seen the, the, the highly dramatised Chernobyl uh, documentary, and I think that shows the consequence of a high command and control culture where people can't call things out, they do as they're told, and all the rest of it. And through time. People stop thinking because they just follow the rules and they blindly follow the rules and sometimes they break the rules and all the rest of it. So because we're all human. So really uh, the Chernobyl incident, and I remember living through it, again, I was in the industry at the time, and uh, it really spurned a movement across the world around safety culture. Up until that point, I think people felt that you could regulate safety through rules and regulations and procedures and engineering and all these different layers of, of systems and, and, and mechanisms that can hopefully prevent accidents and incidents. But the reality is it comes down to culture, it comes down to people, it comes down to those human factors, those ergonomics, those psychologies of where people are. And time and time again, you know, I would be in an investigation and you'd be looking at a guy with 20 years experience or a lady with many years experience, highly skilled, highly intelligent, and you would just look at them and say, what went wrong, you know? And often they didn't know. It was like, well, you know? And I remember one occasion in this particular situation where the gentleman said to me, he said, Sean, he said, I don't know. I really don't know why I did that thing, why I pressed that button or, or whatever it was at the time. He said, I can only liken it to one thing. He said, you know, there are times when you come to work and you look on your wrist, your wrist to see the time and you've left your watch at home. And you don't understand why, because every morning you get out of bed and you 
have your shower, you get dressed, and you put your watch on. But you know, there are once a year or once in a blue moon, there's those moments where we just forget to put our watch on. And why does that happen? You know, because it's a routine and we do it every day. And it's probably because I got distracted, or it's probably because a little bit stressed, or the phone went, or something like that. But these are the types of things that, that, that obviously lead to, to people uh, being distracted and all the rest of it. So anyway, that's all about physical safety, not psychological safety. But so what, what am I talking about? Well, there's not there's not much difference. So at this time, when I when I was the, the manager of this plant. Um, I had I had enough because literally I didn't want to I couldn't sleep at night thinking that people were being harmed. So I brought in the consultants and we went through a, a complete safety cultural audit to really understand what was happening because we had a very macho culture and people did it their way and, and we were having these silly little incidents and accidents. And the reason I'm telling this story is on two levels: one on sort of emotional level and one on a rational level. The emotional level was uh, one day uh, standing on the control panel. Uh, briefing, having a, a team a team chat, and a guy literally fell through the roof. He came through the roof and landed in front of us and broke his back. And now this guy um, was a colleague. Um, he also had a four-year-old daughter who was the same age as my son at the time, and they both went to nursery school together. So every morning, Andrew and I would drop our children off at nursery, and then we'd go into work, and then you know, reverse on the way back on this to it. And here I was faced with this dilemma. I now have to go home and tell his wife, who is the mother of the child in the nursery with my son, that actually he might not pull through. And that had a dramatic effect on me. I actually, at that point, thought, this isn't worth it. I don't care about production. I don't care about the manufacturing numbers. I don't care about all these management instruments. I want to protect people's lives. And that's why we brought in the consultants. And this was 23 years ago. Okay, show me age now. Now, the impact of that in one year was me taking the ball off all the management instruments and all the metrics. Um, our accident frequency rate moved from three point something, which was really poor, to uh, a measure of point two something. So it was literally a 100% improvement in, in safety statistics, which meant, you know, 100% improvement in, in the number of people that were, were being exposed to us. Now, after one year, uh, it was another epiphany moment for me uh, because I was almost on the verge of thinking I was going to get fired because I've taken the eye off the production ball and all the rest of it. And I got a little bit too evangelic about the whole safety culture movement. Um, but surprise, surprise, but of course, with hindsight obvious, uh, guess what? All the numbers went the right way. So in the 20 year history of this plant, it was the highest ever productivity, the highest ever production rate, the lowest safety instance, obviously, the highest quality measures, the lowest environmental impact, yada, yada, yada. You know, so every single business metric went through the sky. And I didn't even focus on any of them. I just focused on people and respect and people's behavior and how can we move people to obviously protect the lives and in some cases the livelihoods. So that was a really uh, interesting part of my career and that's what spun my interest in both employee engagement and also safety culture and how you really get the best out of teams. And I've taken that legacy and moved from being a you know production manager uh, to spend the majority of my career now as a consultant in, in, in communications, engagement and, and, and safety culture sort of thing. So um, a really uh, personal story, which you know had a big impact on me and my outlook, and then got me more into the whole concept of uh, psychological safety. Uh, because when you explore some of the principles of psychological safety, which are well laid out in Amy's books, and she's on YouTube, and she's you know you can watch all her videos, um, they're just some really fundamental things. Um, and I'm going to take you through basically the seven key questions that Google asked themselves. And this is very high level because it's far more complex than this, but it gives you a really good insight into how psychologically safe your teams are. Okay, so if you make a mistake in your team, is it held against you? So this is if we come back to the 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 why, the learning. Um, we only learn if if we fess up, if we you know openly discuss our mistakes, if we realise that we're fallible, especially as a leader. So this concept that leaders are infallible and some superhuman and we don't make mistakes is one of the things that really creates a toxic uh, culture, a toxic environment. When people actually you know, are human, 
and they realize they're human, back to that, you can't change the human condition piece, then it makes it so much easier. So not uh, you know, punishing people for, for, for being human, basically. So we often punish people for making mistakes, but just think about that for a moment. We're actually punishing people just for being human. Can you bring up tough issues? So, you know, if you're struggling with something, do you have a culture where um, it's okay to put your hand up and say you're struggling? Uh, can, can someone help? Or do you put your head down and just uh, pretend it's not happening or don't, you don't want to admit that you don't maybe know all the answers? Again, not knowing all the answers. Another common mistake that leaders make, uh, assuming that they know all the answers when they don't. Um, so this ability to sort of ask the right questions and be able to sort of yeah, seek help or, or seek advice when you don't know is really important. And often in teams that don't perform highly, this this doesn't really exist because of lots of dynamics, but, you know, and, and it could element, an element of personal pride, etc. I think this is a really interesting one about being different in a team because I think people think cohesion in team, and it was mentioned earlier, you know, you're all part of a family. Well, that's great. It's a close-knit community. But also I think everyone recognises the, the need for diversity. Because if you take the cohesive team to the, the nth degree, then you just end up with cookie cut people and, and then everyone just forms and norms in a way which actually is not very healthy because you have lack of a diversity and lack of diverse thought. And this does this comes down to all sorts of things. It's not just about normal diversity and inclusion measures like ethnicity and gender, although these are important. But you know, it's it's just being different. It's just not having been part of a culture and coming from another place, whether you know, in our industry, you've come from in-house to consultancy, or you've come from, you know, another industry. And we all recognize this, okay? So these great industries like finance and oil and gas, you know, they're so protective about, you can only get a job here if you've had 20 years experience in the sector. Well, that's fallacy. It works if you're a nuclear engineer, obviously, but it doesn't really work for a lot of transferable skills, especially in, in the fields that we operate in. So, so that whole kind of exclusion piece is really, you know, harmful for, for, for organizational culture and, and, and team performance. Is it safe to take risks? Well, you know, not only is it safe, it's compulsory, right? We need to take risks or else everything just becomes very entropic. So the ability to sort of, you know, calculate risks, obviously, but the ability to push the boundaries is really important for that innovation that we talk about in growth. Because if you don't take risks, how can you innovate? It's as simple as that. And I think, you know, uh, recent events with COVID have demonstrated how how actually we've, we've been forced to take risks that we, we would normally never have taken. Uh, a whole sort of adage of, you know, crisis is the mother of invention and all the rest of it. But if you look at that and learn from that, there's so many things that we've done over the last year that we probably were angels feared to tread a year ago, a, a bit prior to that, you know. So I think there's some interesting learnings on, on being able to sort of push that envelope. Is it difficult to ask for help? It's, you know, very similar to the one about bringing up tough issues, but, you know, if you're struggling, who can I ask? And again, the whole of the dynamics around why people wouldn't do that, and it might just be because, you know, their personal pride, but also they might just be being over sympathetic for their colleagues thinking they're too busy and all the rest of it. But, you know, you're not going to know unless you ask. So, again, a culture which is free where people think we can do that is a, is a very healthy culture and a very healthy team. Do people undermine your efforts? Why would they do that? Well, they do it, right? We've all worked with backstabbers and all the rest of it. And, and you know, again, deep psychology and why people act like that. But the reality is that they have their own insecurities, their own frustrations. And, you know, the, the reality is that if people can live in a, and operate in a, an environment, in a team where people are more open, we recognize we're fallible and we're prepared to ask all the difficult questions, uh, then a lot of those insecurities go. Uh, and if the insecurities go, then all the, the, the backstabbing and the sniping and all those things go with it. So I'm sure we all recognize how, how wonderful all that would be. And then the last one around very similar to diversity. So we talk about uh, diversity in terms of being different, but also uh, diversity is an inclusion more, more importantly. It's not just having people who are different, but once they're in the camp, do we really utilize them? Do we really value their skills, appreciate their skills, and bring those skills to the table so that it's for the good of everyone, not just for their own personal development and growth and, and their ability to contribute, but actually it's that whole synergy piece, you know, two plus two equals five. So these are the sort of uh, the hows, okay? So I, I gave you the why around innovation, learning, and growth, which has been empirically proven by the likes of Google. 
Uh, we've talked about some of the what's in my own personal journey around, okay, physical safety, but in there it was all around behaviour and the psychological aspects. That's all these questions came up and we addressed a lot of these, you know, before the book was written. Um, these were the types of things that we were introducing so that people uh, felt they were okay to make mistakes and learn from them and push the boundaries and challenge each other and, and recognize we're all fallible, therefore you're more likely to fess up when things go wrong so that we can learn from them. So these these principles were what we applied, I applied, 20 over 20 years ago. So, so I think there's enough evidence in Google and some of the work I've done and some of the work that big organizations have done and a great example of that would be Alcoa back in the 1980s, the biggest aluminium extrusion company in, in the US and the, and, the, and the amazing work that the chief executive had done by focusing on these types of things as well. So I'll leave you with one last slide, which hopefully leaves us opportunity for questions, but coming back to this thing around respect and fear. Um, so respected organizations, feared organizations, respected journalists, but the reality is um, it's not about, uh, you know, fearless organization being brave and bravado and you know jumping over mountains it's actually just having respect for everyone so that we all understand we're human including ourselves so it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to call out call things out if you think they're wrong and it's okay to make uh, suggestions and ideas where maybe perhaps you might be embarrassed because people might think it's a silly idea so i'll leave you this slide just to uh, sort of underline the the fearless organization around Amy's uh, great book and uh, present to you that actually it's all about respect. So thank you for your time. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sean. Um, if anyone has any questions, then pop them in the comments here on the YouTube link or any comments or anything. Um, Sean, I um, really enjoyed that and thank you for sharing so much advice and, and tips and learning for people i really agree with you that leaders really need to be human right yeah like that's such an important part is if we want to create these psychologically safe places where people feel safe they need to but actually you know it's not it's not hard to be human right it's, it's yeah. natural <laughs> it's actually harder to put on the management personas and, and adapt and Form in a way and stick on a uniform and a tie and, and speak with your voice. That's the expectation. It's actually a lot easier to speak to yourself. Yes. However, there are many, many, many leaders, um, and I'm sure you can think of many as well, um, that they've, that bravado has been put on for so long and maybe even a learnt behaviour from when they started out in the workplace. Yeah. But changing that and becoming human and therefore mm. creating these um safe psychologically safe places for their people can, can be quite difficult almost having to change and, and drop the the bravado um have you helped leaders through that do you have advice on that yeah i, th I always think um you know coming back to the, the theme of this conference around inspiration I think we always think as leaders as being very inspiring and you know leading people over the mountain and all this but but the reality is, in my experience, that a lot of leaders are driven by fear, actually. Uh, they're very risk averse. Um, they're looking for predictability and growth, not just growth. They're, they're, as much as they talk about the desire for innovation and risk taking, uh, they have boards and they have shareholders that almost drive a, a counter behavior to that. So mm -hmm. because of that, it, there's a very interesting uh, uh, sort of reframing of, the, of that psychology. And it's very similar to the work I done back in the, the nuclear industry where we had very task focused supervisors in, in this command and control environment and really how do we get the more people focused and the answer was actually quite simple it was we've reframed the task we told them that the people was the task and interestingly these very task focused people who get things done when you told them the task was actually the people then funnily enough they were very good at it and they became very people focused mm -hmm. similarly on a leadership perspective when you sort of show fear in terms of the what if scenario, and this is what Amy does in her book very well, because things like Challenger and Noble and all these, you know, uh, things that went wrong, you know, there but the grace of God goes your eye as a leader. You don't, uh, you know, observe to learn. And, you know, so painting a picture of what could go wrong often is 
create a catalyst for behaviour. And unlearning was then the job because they come to the spec the integration data and from the environment that they feel more that's in their environment behavior for you know disability growth, etc. But you show them the risk of what might go wrong is something which then the behavior should then stand. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, I haven't seen any uh, immediate questions or comments coming in yet, um, but uh, we are nearing the end of the time as well. Sean, if you've got any parting one, your your top piece of advice, one line. One line, to put me on the spot. It, honestly, it's what I think I've said. It's about having mutual respect for others, no matter what their background, ethnicity, gender, social status, um, being human as a leader, and recognizing that we're all infallible. Coming back to that great expression, you can't change the human condition, but you can change the conditions. Uh, thank you, Sean. We're going to quote you in that in a blog, probably, that we um, follow up with. So. Um, huge, huge thank you for joining us um, from Ridya in, in Saudi Arabia today. I um, hope you're um, battling, I'm sure you are, less storms than we are here in the UK right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing so much wisdom and experience um, that you've been with. As I said, we'll follow this up. We'll follow up the recording. We'll follow up the blog. And um, massive thank you to Sean. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you.